So starting with the syllabus. The goal of this video is to give you an understanding of the four fundamental forces of nature. They are the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force. But before we get into it, we also need to talk about a few other things. So first of all, we need to talk about uh, the particle zoo. We need to talk about uh, leptons, baryons and mesons. To give you a rough overview, leptons, baryons and mesons are the three classifications of all particles. So all particles that were discovered can be grouped into either leptons or baryons or mesons. And the fundamental difference between them is leptons are fundamental particles. In other words, they're, they're not made up of any other particle. Baryons and mesons, however, are made up of other particles, and we'll see they're made up of particles called quarks. Mesons are made up of two quarks, baryons are made up of three quarks. Okay, so we'll have to cover that. We'll also have to cover a little bit on quarks. So quarks are just fundamental particles themselves, and we see there from the first sentence, they're the fundamental building blocks of baryons and mesons. Okay. So let's start with the particle zoo. So when physicists were um, looking at the collisions that, uh, that happened in particle accelerators, they started discovering more and more particles. Now the more energy that was available to the two particles that were colliding meant that we had a bigger mass of particles being produced and we had a bigger variety of particles being produced. And generally these particles didn't seem to be related at the time. And because they were apparently unrelated, uh, physicists suggested that the collection of particles that we have is more like a zoo. So you would go and you'd see one particle or another, but you didn't know the relationship between the two of them. Now the image here is um, an image of the particles after being created in a collision. So the large parallel lines that are kind of a yellowy colour, that's the pipe in a particle accelerator. There are parallel lines that are kind of red inside that. Uh, that's the tunnel through which the particles are accelerated. And then what we have is a lot of white lines. And uh, we have this kind of white line, couple of white lines with blue lines on the edge as well. And we've got these green things also. And there are different particles after being created post-collision uh, in a particle accelerator. Now, another viewpoint of that is this image here. And what you have is you've got these particles that travel in a straight line and these particles that travel in a spiral fashion. Now, based on these, a computer can assess what type of particles they are. So depending on the thickness of the line, um, you are able to determine the mass. Depending on the radius of the circular path, you're able to determine the speed, the mass of it, and so on and so forth. And the reason for these circular paths is because you've charged particles in magnetic fields. They travel in a circle. So it's likely in this case that the straight line uh, represent non-charged particles and the circular or spiral paths represent charged particles in the magnetic field. Because charged particles in a magnetic field uh, travel in a circular path. Now if you remember in a magnetic field, uh, the magnetic force which is given by BQV is the centripetal force. So we have the magnetic flux density by the charge by the speed of the particle equals the mass of the particle by the speed of the particle squared divided by the radius of the circular path. And when we cancel off the velocity, or the speed on either side, and cross multiply by the R, we get this thing, BQR, magnetic flux density charged by the radius of the circular path, is equal to mass by velocity. And just as a kind of side note, mass by velocity is momentum, so if you're ever asked for momentum of a charged particle in the particle accelerator, you'd multiply B by Q by R. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is because if you look at the first um, equation, the right-hand side of it, mv squared over r, what we can see is there are particles with big radii and small radii. The particles with the big radii are the particles with the big r value on that right-hand side of the top equation. So as a result, either those particles are travelling faster or those particles have a larger mass. So a computer can determine... Uh, the mass of the particle based on the radius and they'll also know the velocity that the particle is travelling. Um, I also put up this slide because sometimes you may be asked questions related to this. So the magnetic field and particle uh, 
um, situation you came across in earlier chapters can come up here as well. Okay, so these are examples of particle groupings from the log tables. And you can see that we have three particle groupings if we look at the right-hand column, leptons, mesons, and baryons. The thing to remember is the leptons are fundamental particles, so they're not made up of anything else. The mesons and baryons are made up of quarks. In fact, the mesons are made up of a quark and an antiquark, or you can just say two quarks, and the baryon is made up of three quarks or three antiquarks. So they're organized in terms of mass as well. The leptons are the least massive, they've got the smallest mass, the mesons are the middle massive, if you will, and the baryons are the most massive. That's page 48, and you'll get your values there for half-life and mass if required in a question. And then on the next page, we have the six quarks. So quarks are also fundamental particles. You're given the symbols and the charge of each of those. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of background. Here is a different way of looking at the relationship between them. In particle physics, when we have an accelerator and we collide the particles together, we're basically just looking for the structure of the universe. And the model underpinning the structure of the universe that's the most popular at the moment is called the standard model. And the standard model is looking for a bunch of particles, basically, in particle accelerators. Those particles are grouped into two categories, matter and antimatter, or force particles. So the matter and antimatter I mentioned already, the matter and antimatter can be broken into two categories. Leptons are the light particles, they're the fundamental particles. And the other particles then that are made up of quarks, um, the general name is hadrons, but they're broken up then into baryons or mesons. A lot of terms, but look, mesons are made up of two quarks, baryons made up of three quarks, and any particle that is made up of any number of quarks is called a hadron. Leptons then aren't made up of quarks, they're their own fundamental particles. So I've mentioned those, and if we look at the right-hand side then, it's kind of unusual that forces have particles, but that's the current understanding in physics. It's that rather than think about forces as being an action at a point, like you bring two magnets together and suddenly, magically, they attract each other, or if you have two charged particles, magically they attract or repel each other. The explanation at the moment is that a particle is actually being exchanged between the magnets uh, that causes them to attract or repel. Or a particle is being um, exchanged between the two charged particles which cause them to attract or repel. And for each of the four forces that we're going to deal with, it's suggested that there are different particles that make each of those forces occur. So um, I mentioned el the electric force and the magnetic force, and supposedly the photon is the particle that allows the, that force to act. So force may be a bit of an unusual way to phrase it. It's almost like an interaction between um, an interaction between stuff or matter, and to make that interaction occur, there's an exchange of particles. Now we'll come across the four forces in a moment. Uh, I'll just note there that the graviton is the only one that hasn't been discovered yet. Okay, so there we have our force carriers, and this is a simplified model, supposedly simplified, of all of the particles that make up the universe, according to the standard model of elementary physics. So it's made up of the force carriers, it's made up of this thing called the Higgs boson, which is supposedly the reason why uh, masses have mass, so it's the mass creator. It's made up of these six particles called quarks, which are the fundamental constituents of matter. So quarks make up mesons and baryons. And then it's also made up of these six fundamental particles that um, cannot be broken down into anything smaller. Okay. Now, we, I just want to take a look at the relative size of atoms and subatomic sub particles. So you can pause the video there to watch that. Or let me show you an animation. So <clears throat> we're looking at a relative scale here of about a meter. So that's about a meter across. And we can see that a basketball is within that scale, a teapot, uh, the viewport. So about that size is, is of the meter scale, not quite a meter, but it's, it's kind of between zero and a meter, between one centimeter and a meter. We even have the largest hailstone. So if I get smaller, <clears throat> 
what I have here now is roughly about a square inch, so that's about a centimeter and a half squared. And within that scale, you could see a sunflower, a coffee bean, an ant. You can see that's about um, one and a half centimeters squared, a marble, a uh, pencil of lead, grain of rice. And as I go down smaller and smaller, we're now at the scale of a millimeter. So this is a thousandth of a meter uh, up and left and right. And if you had a, a microscope that could see to a thousandth of a meter, you'd see things like dust mites, amoeba, which are uh, organisms, grains of sand, salt, and the largest bacteria. If I kept going, and I got down to a micrometer, so that's a millionth of a meter, it's at that kind of size that you begin to see the largest virus. There's another virus there, so the coronavirus is about this size as well. Uh, other, viri, uh, other virus, uh, E. coli, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome are about a millionth of a meter. And you'll see that we still haven't reached anywhere near the size of an atom. There's the HIV virus, keep going, hepatitis, we're down to DNA, the phospholipid bilayer, which is the, uh, the cell outer wall. We're down to the lowest man-made structures. Okay, and now we're at 10 to the minus 9. So 10 to the minus 9, it's a thousand millionth of a metre. And at that size, we can start seeing large atoms, cesium atoms, and then carbon atoms and kind of molecules as well, water molecules. And if I keep going down, if I go 10 times smaller, I start seeing the hydrogen atom and the helium atom, which are two of the smallest atoms. Now, this is where the uh, electron microscope stops. So an electron microscope is the uh, is the best way we can see this the scale of stuff. We can't actually see anything smaller. But this is an animation, so if I keep going, I'm now down to a millionth of a millionth of a metre. Still going. 10 times smaller than that, and we start seeing nuclei, so the larger of the nuclei, the uranium nucleus, we start seeing chlorine nucleus, uh, that's the classical electron, so not the electron that we understand at the moment, and as we get down to, this is a thousand times smaller than a million of a million, we start seeing the proton and the neutron, that will give an idea of how small it is, and then if we get even smaller, So a millionth of a millionth of a millionth, we start seeing the largest of the quarks, largest of the quarks, up and down quarks. The strange quark, charm quark, bottom quark, high energy neutrino, we keep going. So look at the scale here, and eventually we'll see the top quark. Now I'm going to keep going just to show you. So neutrinos then are much, much uh, smaller than those particles, the quarks. Is there anything else? And then 10 to the minus 34, and there's an alternative way of looking at the universe. It's in terms of um, strings or super strings, and those lengths are so small. 10 to the minus 34, 10 to the minus 35. Okay, that'll give you an idea of the structure of the universe and the size of quarks. In the next video, I'll take a look at the four fundamental forces of nature.